that brings together Harvard's outstanding group of decision research scholars, behavioral economists, and other behavioral scientists to focus their energies on improving how decisions are made, both by leaders and by individuals, to uh, improve public welfare. I do want to mention that immediately following this event, we're hosting a screening of dishonesty in Nye, BC, and I'll be walking a group over right after it's in the Taubman building. Um, I am delighted to introduce Mike Norton, one of our affiliated faculty members who will introduce our other terrific speakers. Mike is the Har Harold M. Brearley Professor of Bin Business Administration at the Harvard Business School and a member of the Harvard B. <laughs> uh, a member of Harvard's Behavioral Insights Group. He holds a BA in Psychology and English from Williams College and a PhD in Psychology from Princeton. It's a small college in New Jersey. Prior to joining HBS, Professor Norton was a fellow at the MIT Media Lab at MIT Sloan School of Management, where he worked with Professor Ariely. He is the co-author with Elizabeth Dunn of the book Happy Money, The Science of Smarter Spending. And his work has been published in a number of leading academic journals, including Science, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Psychological Science, and the Journal of Consumer Research. And he's been covered in media outlets such as The Economist, The Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. Mike, take it away. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, my pleasure to now introduce the uh, people to my left. I don't, um, they also have a very long thing that I could read about them, but I thought I would introduce them since you probably know who they are. Uh, instead, what I think about them. <laughs> and then after I'm done, I'll say which one I like this, better. This is a good introduction <laughs> for uh, talking about lying. <laughs> exactly. So Francesca Gino, uh, uh, to my far left, is my colleague at the Harvard Business School. Dan likes to make fun of that we always say the Harvard Business School, not because there's several of them. Anyway. So uh, at, at the Harvard Business School in the Negotiation, Organizations, and Markets Unit, Francesca is uh, one of the most, if not the most, prolific social scientists alive. Uh, no exaggeration. She works on things ranging from wearing counterfeit sunglasses, which is something we worked on, to uh, all sorts of fascinating research on un unethical behavior. She also looks at the positive side of things as well, designing fascinating interventions to help employees bring out their best selves at work. Truly an enormous range of interests uh, and uh, research topics. Scattered. I would Scattered say. is the other one uh, that uh, you could also call that. I would call it uh, amazingly creative in so many domains. She's one of the, your favorite people. If you have any idea about anything, it is always fun to brainstorm with Francesca, which is a wonder. If I, if I thought to myself, uh, I wonder what would happen if, <laughs> if like cows wore hats, I would think, I should go talk to Francesca about that. I bet she has some good ideas. So uh, Francesca Gino, thank you for joining us. And to my uh, immediate left is uh, Professor Dan Ariely uh, from just, not the Duke, but just Duke uh, University. Dan was uh, my, uh, as Abby mentioned, my um, postdoc uh, sponsor. And I wanted to tell a, a story about one of my first interactions with Dan. So I was, um, I, I finished my PhD and I was lost in the world. And uh, a friend said, you should go talk to this guy, Dan Ariely. He's interesting. And I said, I, had, I was unemployed. So I said, OK, that sounds fine. So I went and talked to Dan. And I, I was looking for a job, kind of, but I didn't want to say I needed a job. So I chatted with Dan for a little while. And he said, well, uh, why don't you come and work here with me? So I thought, OK, that, that, that might be OK. So he said, uh, I said, well, what do you want me to work on? You know, I thought it was a job, right? So someone's supposed to say, here's the projects. And he said, uh, I don't know. Why don't you go away and come back and tell me what you want to do? Which is a very rare thing for a boss to say. It was very, I was stressed. So I went home for a week and thought, what do I want to work on? At the time, uh, there were, this is a long time ago because we're old now, there was this thing that had just occurred called online dating. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Uh, it was new at this time. This was like 2002-ish, something like that. So I thought, we should study that. And so I said, I went back and I said, we need to study online dating. It's fast. It's this new market for matching people. Everyone could be so happy if we figure out how it works. So I said, why don't we hand out some surveys and stuff and get a sense of it? And Dan said, uh, no, that's, that's super boring. And he said, here's what we're going to do instead. We're going to get a couple of MIT undergrads and we're going to have them build their own online dating website for MIT kids and run crazy experiments on MIT undergrads. And I, I remember thinking in my head, we can do that? <laughs> and that's consistently what you have when you work with Dan, is you, you have an idea, and then he says, you know what else you could do? And then you think to yourself, 
we can do that? <laughs> it's this delightful uh, way of uh, collaborating. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Dan Ariely. So I thought I would start, if we can play the first clip, actually, before we start uh, discussing, which is the opening part of, of the movie, and it's uh, interesting to watch. Can we bring that up? I was kind of like the big man on campus. It kind of got a little easier with each one that I did after that to the point where it started to feel a little bit comfortable and there was nothing wrong with doing it. I knew it was wrong. I didn't know how illegal it was. I figured it was illegal. I just didn't think I was going to get caught. When you have that, the mindset, or when you think that everybody else is doing it, it makes it a lot easier to consider what you've done is legitimate. I, I'm pretty sure I convinced myself that I wasn't harming anything or anyone. A white lie now became a huge black lie. And oh, she's such a liar. I wasn't the slut. You know, I wasn't the partier. I wasn't the bad girl. I wasn't the drug druggie. I was a liar. At a certain point, the monster's so big that it doesn't need you anymore, and you can't control it, and you can kind of just hope that it doesn't eat you. I even asked my lawyer, I mean, I'm certainly not going to go to jail for this. I mean, you know, what, you know, what, what, what do they do with guys like me? They don't send me to jail. Can I pick up paper on the road? I mean, what am I going to do? And he says, no, they send guys like you to jail. While I wished I didn't have to go through that, I understand now, oh, OK, I'm not the only one. This is a deeply human experience. So the, uh, it, Dan has this, what is it called, the honesty box? The truth box? The truth box, The yeah. truth box that uh, he travels around with, where you can go inside and uh, tell, tell on camera and be recorded some terrible lie that you told. And what's fascinating is people really like it. Uh, almost all of us lie all the time. Studies show that we really lie an enormous uh, amount of time. And yet we walk around thinking, I'm a pretty nice guy. And so my first question for you is, how do we do that? How do we lie all the time, and yet all of us still walk around saying, I'm great and nice and a good human being? So, so I think it's because at the moment when we tell a lie, uh, we have this tremendous capacity to rationalize it. Uh, think about white lies. Right? White lies is kind of the... The definition is a lie that doesn't help you, but makes the other person better. So in some sense, you're sacrificing something. Um, but the reality is that most white lies have some benefit to you as well. You don't really want to fight with that person. You don't really want to have the, the outcome of, of this thing revealed. But at the moment, we don't think about ourselves as liars. We're basically kind of making an interesting, complex computation about cost and benefit and so on. And Honesty doesn't always, always win. If you think about it, there's lots of human values, right? Honesty is one of them. Uh, but it's not the case that honesty always wins. So what happens when multiple values collide? Yeah. That, that's, uh, uh, dishonesty uh, creates. Uh, by the way, this, this truth box uh, was very interesting. So we, we set it up and we asked people to come and tell us stories. And some of the stories are amazing. Um, this one guy went in and he said, you know, I was on a date, it was the third date, and we were deciding to have sex. Uh, the, the woman I was dating asked me if I have been tested recently. I said yes. And then the moment I have an orgasm, I think to myself, why did I lie? Um, he, said, he said, how did I become the person who lies this way? Right? Slightly improved sexual enjoyment, but lying in this way. He said, he said I was really unclear about how could I behave like this? How, how did I become that person? And he said, this was four or five years ago. Um, we're still together. We're getting married in a few months, and I haven't told her. Um, now, he goes and does this in the booth, and he signs a consent form to put it online. And Yael, the producer, says, you know, we just can't put it online. So we call him up, and we say, are you sure? He said, yes, I'm sure. 
Uh, we didn't do it on their wedding day. We, we <laughs> waited. <laughs> but, but you know, we all have kind of a complex relationship uh, with the truth, and there's some things that we, that we say or that we do, and, and we keep on struggling with. And, and how do you uh, make sense of it, uh, move on, uh, improve the kind of calculus that we, that we do moving forward? No? Yeah. Actually, they got married. It wasn't that long ago. They got married in October. So, yes, um, as far as we know. And um, the other thing is, one of the things we see in the movie is that, uh, so, you know, Mike, Francesca, and I have been doing all kinds of research on dishonesty. We, and, and our research is kind of limited, you know, how much can we ask people to steal from us in the lab, right? We, our research budget is limited. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, these are small amounts. People can steal up to maybe thirty, forty, fifty dollars. And, and one of the questions when we went to do this movie was, to what extent are the kind of things that we're studying in the lab the same kind of a thing about big cheating, and to what degree is just different animals? And we're studying small cheating, and there's big cheating, and they're just not, not the same. And, and, and if you see the movie, you will realize that when you look at these big cheaters, if you look at what they did at the end, you would say, this is not me. I can't believe this, this, somebody does that. And this is clearly not related to the kind of research we do. But when you look at the first step they, they took, you can say, hey, this could be me. Uh, and I can see how the research uh, fits with this. Uh, so uh, Joe Pep that you saw uh, in, the, in the introduction, uh, this was a guy, uh, he was a, a student. Um, was a cyclist, was part of the US Olympic team, uh, takes two years to finish his degree, goes back to cycling, and he realized that everybody's a little faster than him, that something happened in these two years when he uh, took some time off. And he goes to a friend, and he's, he's kind of crying and upset and disappointed with himself, and the friend gives him an address to go and see a physician. And he goes to see a physician, and there's a white coat and a stethoscope, and the physician writes for him a prescription for EPO. EPO is a, is a cancer drug that produces more red blood cells, right? Really good if you want more oxygen. And he takes this uh, prescription, and he goes to a pharmacy, and his insurance company pays for it. And he pays, you know, whatever the deductible is, the $5. And he goes back to his room, and he gives himself lots of injections, because in an athlete, you do all kinds of things. And he gives himself one more injection. And then after a while, he realized that everybody else is giving them self-injection. Then he moved to another team, and they don't only give them self-injections, they get other orders for other drugs as well, so it's not just EPO. And then there's a shortage of EPO. But he has friends on the Chinese team, and his friends on the Chinese team hook him up with a factory in China, and he starts importing uh, EPO. And then people on another team hear about it, and they ask him, uh, for help as well, so he helps them, and, and you know the story continues, and eventually he's, he's a drug dealer. Now, you look at this and you say, could I ever start importing EPO? <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like it's us. But when you look at this, and he said, I asked him when in this process would he have stopped? And he said that probably if the insurance company rejected his claim. Hmm. But, but imagine you do this, right? and you're dis upset with yourself, you go to a doctor and they give you a prescription. Don't you go to the pharmacy? Of course you do. And then the pharmacy, they give you the injections. Don't you take them to your room? Don't, don't you inject as well, right? Every step was kind of, uh, seems sensible given the previous step. And, and that's actually what we see across, uh, across all the interviews, um, that slippery slope is really a, a serious problem. Thinking about, um even in that example, some, some of what he was doing was lying to other people, you know, pretending you're clean, but in fact you're cheating. And then th that story really shows that a lot of what he was doing was actually lying to himself about who he was and what. So how do you think, you talked about white lies. White lies are attractive because we can say, well, someone else will benefit, and yep. so I'm lying to help you. How do you think about the difference between lying out and lying in just to ourselves to make ourselves feel better? Yeah. So, so I think actually there are very few real white lies, right? So the true white lie is that somebody else benefits and you don't benefit at all. So, um, you know, when I lived here, we used to uh, blame the tube on lots of things, right? So the, 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 the transportation is, uh, every time you're late, it's a transportation problem. It's not that you 
started late or, um, you know, so it's clearly a lie that helps the other person because you don't say to them, hey, I didn't really care about you so much to leave on time. Uh, I, I didn't mind being late. Now I realize that you use that on <laughs> me <laughs> hundreds of times. <laughs> That's very hurtful. Um, but, but it also helps you. So it's not really a pure, a pure white lie. A pure white lie would only help the other person and not, and not you. Um, and then, of course, so, so I think it's kind, of the, it's kind of a step of doing a complex social computation about some of your benefit and some of the other mm. benefits, some selfish, some not, and then you can uh, continue with that. Um, and I think that once you have this mindset, uh, it's easy to move forward. Uh, so, so this is not scientific, but from time to time people come to me after a, a lecture and they said, uh, my kid is unable to lie. So no, no matter how much I try to teach them how to lie, my kid is just unable, <laughs> unable to lie. And all of these parents have kids with, there's one thing that is 100% have been common to, to all of those kids. And what do you think it is? I'll give you a hint. I used to teach at MIT. Asperger's. Mm. It's supposed to be a joke. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, no, but the truth is that there's lots of MIT uh, kids with, with Asperger's, right? Um, and, and the thing with Asperger's is that one of the issues with Asperger's is theory of mind. So what is theory of mind? Is your ability to put yourself in the position of somebody else and to infer how they would feel. Right? And all of a sudden you can say, I don't believe to hurt you. If I don't want to hurt your feelings, I have to understand how, how you feel and I have to do this complex mental exercise. People with, people with Asperger have a very hard time with theory of mind and it seems like they don't develop the ability to, to cheat. They, and I think kind of the um, white lies is kind of the gateway uh, drug to, to dishonesty. That's what we get trained on, that, that we, can, we can trade off dishonesty with other uh, human values, and then we keep on trading it in, in other things. And, you know, in the social world, would you want to live in a world that everybody told you the truth all the time? Not so much. Um, but once we move to the business world, all of a sudden the rules are different. But the problem is that we don't get trained on the rules of the business world. We get trained on the rules of the social world, and we just apply them more generally. So I, I want you to care about my feeling. I don't want my accountant to, to care about my mm -hmm. feeling. Uh, but, but if we use the same rules, we we get into this trouble. We did an experiment together on, on theory of mind with uh, little kids. So uh, imagine uh, this task, it's a coin flipping task, but here's how it works. We say to little kids, I think we started at age five, mm -hmm. maybe. They're Italian, which makes it funnier actually, because you'll see, you'll see in a second why that's funny. So uh, here, here's how this, this task works. We, we tell these kids age five to 13, uh, there's a great highlighter and a lousy pencil, and you can pick one. Which one do you want? And we say, or what you can do to decide is take this coin and go in that room over there and flip it and let the coin decide who gets what. So what happens, little kids, basically, they don't flip the coin. They just grab the highlighter and run screaming and give the pencil to the other kid. Older kids, what they do is they grab the coin and go to the other room and flip it. And then they come back and say, oh, I won the highlighter. <laughs> So they're just as likely to end up with the highlighter, but what they've learned is theory of mind. So now they know that you'll think that I'm a nice guy because I did the fair thing with the coin. And in fact, they, some people think kids learn morality over time. What our experiment shows is that they just learn to appear moral <laughs> over time by doing fair seeming things all over the place and then secretly taking whatever it is uh, that they want. And well, it's funny that they're Italian because as we know, Italians are deeply unethical people. <laughs> <laughs> And I realize this is being recorded, so I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, is this, uh, what has this taught you about grading? About grading? When you grade, uh, you, you care about the appearance of fairness? <laughs> you mean just throw darts? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we have this new experiment uh, on, on dishonesty. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, so uh, imagine a, a die, a six-sided die, and I say, why don't you toss it and I'll pay you whatever it comes up on. Comes on six, I'll give you six dollars. Comes on five, I'll pay you five dollars and so on. And I say, but you can get paid based on the top side or the bottom side, top or bottom, you decide, but don't tell me. So what do you do? You decide, top or bottom. I said, did you decide? You said, yes. I said, okay, now roll the die. And let's say it came with five on the bottom and two on the top. And I said, what did you decide? 
Now, if you decided bottom, you say bottom, no problem. But if you decided top, now you have a conflict. Do you say top and get $2, or do you change your mind? And you say, you say bottom. And people do it 20 times, and they have this sheet of paper, and they say, yes, I decided. And then they say the, coin, the, the die fell on 5 and 2, and I chose 5, and they keep on making this list. And, and they keep on choosing every time, top or bottom, top or bottom. And when you run this experiment, you, you find that people are incredibly lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not only that, but luck has a way of being concentrated on the 6-1 uh, die tosses compared to the 3-4. So that's kind of the basic experiment, and we find that lots of people cheat a little bit. Um, but now think about the following. You come to the lab, and we say, we have two versions of this experiment today. And the way they are different is that the exchange rate between points on the die and how much money you get. And we have one version where you could get a maximum $4, and we have another version that the maximum is $40. Right? So it's the same game, just the, the payment is very different. And then we say, please toss a coin, and we'll see which one you got, the, the $4 version or the $40 version. They toss it, and no matter what they get, we said, ah, oh, you got the $4 version. <laughs> and then the research assistant looks around, and he says, listen, my boss is not here today, so I'll tell you what. You got $3 to show up for the experiment, to pay for the bus fare. If you'll give me the $3, I'll say you got the other <laughs> coin flip. So the first question is, what percentage of the students basically bribe the research assistant? So what do you think? How many people think it's around 10%? Just raise your hand. How many people think it's below 25? Between 25 and 50? Between 55 and 75? Between 50 and 75? Wow, above 75? Above 85? OK, so it's 90. <laughs> <laughs> And, but what do they do after this? They cheat much more, and they start stealing. <laughs> now, let me tell you what I mean by stealing. So, so I told you what cheating is, right? That they get extra lucky. But let's say you make this list, and you say, you know, I, I, I decided five and two, and you make the list, and at the end you say, I deserve $27. Now we give you an envelope with $50. And we say, pay yourself as much as you deserve. The money you didn't make, leave in the envelope. And as you leave the room, drop it in this big box with all the other envelopes. So now people have a chance to steal money. And, and we think about this. It, it feels very different, right? Because with the die, you can say, oh, yes, yes, I really meant up. I really meant down. You can still fool yourself. But once you wrote $27, it's really hard for you to say, yes, let me take 30 And in general, we find that people cheat but don't steal in this experiment. Um, even when we go to criminals, so we've been doing this experiment outside of the parole office in, in Durham, um, you know, waiting for people to come out of parole, they also cheat and don't steal. This corruption experiment I described to you was the first time we saw lots of stealing. And you know, it fits very much with things from social psychology, but, but it's a very disturbing thing, right? Because it means that somebody could have kind of been trained for life about honesty, and yes, they cheat a little bit here and there, but all of a sudden, people come to a new environment, and you tell them, hey, the, the person who runs this environment is corrupt. In fact, they're asking you for a bribe. Now, nobody has ever offered us a bribe in the experiment. It's not people, these the, uh, undergrads come by themselves and say, hey, let me, let me try bribe. But the moment you say, bribe here is acceptable, I'm actually asking you for it, people kind of abandon uh, almost everything they know about morality and change quite, hmm. quite dramatically. Uh, Quite, quite disturbing. I think that highlights, too, this notion of um, typically ambiguity is so incredibly important to allow us to do these things. So it's, it's stealing. It's much harder to steal because it's not ambiguous. It's clear that you're doing something wrong. As Dan said, the coin, the, the die on top or bottom, there's this ambiguity about what you might have said. And for Francesca, do you want to describe our self-deception experiments, the cheating on the test the one ones? The one with Zoe and yeah. Dan? Yeah, because I think those are a nice example of uh, how we use that wiggle room. Yeah, to uh, cheat later on. And so we were running these studies, a very simple, where you have, imagine having two types of tasks <coughs> with a bunch of questions with general knowledge. And in one case, you just go through the test page by page, and then you get paid for whatever it is that you solve correctly. And in the other case, we tell you to take the test, and just to help you out keep uh, a sense of your score, you have the answer at the bottom. 
So you can imagine <laughs> what people end up doing. All of a sudden, the performance is better on the second, uh, in the second condition than in the first one. But what is interesting is that we then tell them, you're about to do a second test now on a different set of questions, general knowledge. Can you predict your performance? And so you would imagine that people realize that they're doing better in the second condition because they're looking at the answer, and instead they don't. They still think that they're going to do better, uh, and so they predicted that on the second test where they're going to have no answers at the bottom, they're going to be doing much better than in the first condition. So somehow we use our own cheating to believe <laughs> that we are much uh, better. And this, the reward thing that we did too? You wanna <laughs> Do you remember? That was actually a, a then idea <laughs> where we gave people a certificate. Uh, it was actually triggered by something that happened in Italy where for a while at the university was giving out the wrong uh, score on the degree when you graduated from college. Like let's imagine that it, it goes from 60 to 100. If you're below 60, you don't graduate. And you would imagine that if you know that you got I don't know, a 78, but you see on your degree an 85, that you actually go back and tell the office and people were not. <laughs> like, oh, I'm clearly an 85. Um, so in this experiment, we were giving people certificates on the score that they got on the first test, and we were able to show that it exacerbates the effect. Yeah. So think about, uh, you know, when you took the SAT or GRE, right? You to do these books, and you look at the question, and you say, I'm not so sure. Let me look at the answer key, and then you say, oh, yes, I knew that uh, all along, right? If you, did, if you did the grading this way. So, so the main thing was that, but then the certificate, and you can think about the certificate in all kinds of ways. Imagine it's your resume, and you, you change something on the resume at some, at some point, and then your resume is hanging somewhere, or a certificate, or, and it reminds you that you're actually better than you, than you are. Turns out people uh, increase their understanding of their own quality. So it's very easy to convince people that they are better than they are. We haven't tried to convince people they're worse, uh, but on, on the better one, it's very easy. Yeah, There's, if you think about these, these uh, scandals that happen from time to time with public figures who have pretended that they, Brian Williams is the latest one. He said he was in active combat, but he wasn't. Hillary Clinton had a thing where she also said that. A lot of politicians will claim they served in the military, and then it turns out they didn't serve in the military. And I'm sure some of them are lying, but you, you can imagine that things happen in your life and someone introduces you at a talk and says, as you know, uh, Dan served uh, in the active military, and you could correct them or not, and usually you would let it go, and then people start writing, as you know, he served in the military over and over again, and then in your mind you start saying, maybe I did serve in the military, I'm a pretty <laughs> brave person, yeah. and then you start getting recognition that you're that type of person who did that, and you can see again over time it's this slope thing again where a little thing at time one can suddenly snowball into you believe you're that person. And it's very hard for us to imagine, you know, I would never convince myself that I did something that I didn't do. Yeah. And even this little cheating on the test, we can do it to you right away. We can, we can make you cheat on a test and you instantly say, I'm amazing, <laughs> I'm the best test taker in the world. And if we brand you with that, you even more are very willing to say, that's who I am now forever. And we tried to pay people to stop. Yeah. We said, hey, we're going to give you a huge monetary bonus if you guess how well you do on the next test. We were trying to say, think about maybe it was the answers that caused you to do really well. And it had no effect on people. They couldn't undo the deception once it had already been done. Yeah. Yeah. So let me. Uh, one other topic that I think is interesting is uh, the question of uh, cultural differences. Uh, so how many people here uh, grew up in places outside of the US? Just kind of, uh, okay, keep your hands up. And how many people think that in your country of origin, people cheat less than Americans? Less than Americans, keep your hands up. Less, <laughs> le uh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> less, less than Americans, so let's, let's see, uh, German? UK? Where are you from? Sorry? Mongolia. Mongolia. Are you, you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Canada? Canada? We are, yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Israel? Uh, Finland. Finland. Um, so, 
so we tried, we tried different countries. So I, I grew up in Israel. Uh, so the first country we went to test was, was Israel. So how many of you think that the Israelis cheat more in our experiments than the Americans? I, I should, I should, it's, it's really, I mean, this is really interesting because you can see it's the people in the back rows that are, yes. are raising their hands. How many this people would really rather die than vote on this question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> this is really a test of political correctness. It's not, uh, anyway, I thought that the Israelis would cheat more, cheat just the same. Uh, Francesca said, come to Italy, we'll show you uh, what the Italians can do. <coughs> but we tried lots of countries. We tried uh, Turkey and China and Germany and Portugal and South Africa and Kenya. We tried lots of, lots of places. And we, we really don't find many differences. And, and here's the thing, right? There's a corruption index. And we know that Kenya is leading the world in corruption. Uh, by the way, Canadian, sorry, was it Canadian? Just the same. Just the same. Uh, the British also. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so, so, you know, how, how do you reconcile the fact that we don't find differences, but the corruption index finds big differences? And, and the reality is that what happened is that culture matters, but culture matters in a domain-by-domain domain specific way. So think about something like illegal downloads. We just don't feel bad about it, right? We, we don't think of it as something morally wrong. We just say, yeah, we know it's illegal. We call it illegal download, but, but we don't feel bad about it. There are other things that we feel bad about it, but it's not as if, if we start downloading illegal stuff that we become immoral across all domain. What we have is we have these partitions of different aspects of life. How do we think about cheating on taxes, and how do we think about infidelity, and how do we think about illegal downloads? And culture matters on those, on those kind of things. Those, those are the big three. The big three? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it's, it's uh, kind of important to realize that we're not going to solve this honesty by, by changing the backbone of individuals, uh, but we do need to think of domain by domain specific way and how do we get people to behave uh, in a better way. And this also, by the way, was something that happens. Uh, one of the people I, we interviewed, uh, not in, didn't uh, make it to the movie, um, was a guy, um, he uh, basically grew up in a crime family. And th the story is very interesting by itself, but, but the, the bottom line was that when you look at what this guy was doing, you would think that he was amoral. There's just no morals. But that wasn't true. He basically divided the world into two parts. There was family and non-family. <laughs> and within the family, he was incredibly moral. Like you, you, if you were in part of that family and you shook his hand, there was no issue about not doing it. Outside of the family, no morals whatsoever. Right? But, but it, and that was an incredible partition in two areas, but we all have a little bit of that, uh, of that partition. So then you probably get this question all the time from people, especially from organization, asking you, so it seems very easy to get people to cheat. What can we do to make them better? What's your answer? So, so there's, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of answers. First of all, I think we, the, the legal perspective is a perspective of long-term thinking and cost-benefit analysis, right? So what, what do we say? How do we prevent crime? We say, let's just put a big punishment there. For example, let's do the death penalty. And, and what is the theory behind it? You say, I'm thinking about committing a crime. Let me think about the cost and benefit, and I'll decide if to engage with it uh, or not. But, but we know that the death penalty actually doesn't change crime rate. I mean, there's no, it's not a randomized control trial, right? But, but we have states that have the death penalty and states that don't, and there's no statistical evidence for any, any effect. And think about how would it even work? You come home, you're angry with your significant other, you go to the kitchen, you take a knife, and you say, oh, we have the death penalty, um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's do something else instead. <laughs> let's dice instead. <laughs> would be the... so, so, so people don't think long term, but, but when we think about the legal approach, uh, that's what we're saying. We're saying, let's just do a big, pe big penalty. But, but instead, we need to think about education, up, up front, moral codes, behavior, and we need to think about the moment of temptation, which is some of the stuff mm -hmm. we've done together. So I think that's the first thing. And then the second thing is to realize how corrosive conflicts of interest are. So, you know, when, when conflicts of interest, nobody sees themselves as being influenced by by conflicts of interest. It's very hard. 
Uh, but we have this tremendous ability. You, you go, you meet somebody, uh, you buy them a, a sandwich and a drink, and all of a sudden they like you and they start looking at life from your perspective. And as a, a friendship creating mechanism, it's wonderful. But if you have a lobbyist and a government official, not, not so good. Right? So, so conflicts of interest, and we have lots of those, um, are incredibly corrosive. And the question is, how do we, how do we minimize them? And conflicts of interest usually create flexibility and sometimes financial gains. Um, but you know, ask yourself, do you want the physician that gives you advice of what treatment to do to also be the one getting paid by what treatment you, you choose? Do you want the dentist that decides you know, what treatment to give you to be the one that makes more money after one option versus the other? Um, how about your mechanic? So, so second opinions are great in separating people from their opinion and service, but maybe we don't want to do it everywhere, but there are certainly cases that we, that we want to do. Um, so I think we need to think about education, and we need to think about culture, and we think about the moment, the moment of temptation. The stuff that um, uh, we've done together on this um, has to do with getting people to uh, sign something before they feel um, a piece of paper. So, so think about court. If you went to court, do you want people to swear in the beginning of the testimony or at the end? Right? It's kind of clear that nobody, like you, you say, oh, okay, here's your testimony, and then you say, I swear that everything I said is true. It's somehow clear to us that that's a bad idea. Right? So what do we do? We get people to testify in the beginning. And they basically set themselves up to saying, okay, this is the mind frame, and here's what we're going to go through it. But somehow in the legal framework, when people feel forms, where do we get people to sign? At the end, right? We somehow have lost this insight that signing something is not just about verification, it's about a mindset. So the experiment we did was we um, basically got people to sign all kinds of statements in the beginning or at the end, and we saw that when people sign in the beginning, they cheat much less. You know, by the time you finish the form, if you get the signature, you don't say just, oh yeah, I have to sign, let me go back and change. It's too late, it's over. Um, so there's other things like that. We, I think it's actually said we don't have that many opportunities to reduce, um, to reduce cheating. I mean, not many people come to us with experiments uh, wanting to let us uh, do this, but I think there's tremendous, uh, tr tremendous opportunity. Um, one more uh, fun experiment. So imagine you're, you're in one of our dye experiments, um, and we connect you to a lie detector. And the question is, can the lie detector detect the lying? And the answer is yes, not all the time, but it can detect. What happens when we tell you that the money is not just going to go to you, but some of it is going to go to you, and some of it is going to go to a charity that you love? How do you think people change their behavior? Two things happen. People cheat more, and the lie detector stops working. And, and why? Because the lie detector detects a conflict. I want a bit more money, but it's wrong. I want a bit more money, but it's wrong. But if it's for a good cause, you don't feel bad about it. Right? Imagine you connected Robin Hood to a lie detector. You know, would, would it show anything? Of course not. So lots of times when we do things, uh, there's a hierarchy of, of morals. And many times you can justify it completely by thinking that you're actually under the, the, the working of a very different um, moral, uh, something like um, it will be for the benefit of all the people who are working for me, it's good for the university, what, what, whatever it is, and it allows people to behave very differently. Do you have a sense of where you're headed next with dishonesty? Are you interested in working with organizations to stop? Are you interested in understanding more of the underlying psychology, or you um, want to get more weird stories from people? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I would like to work more on, on the corruption side, so uh, the part where it's uh, becoming endemic and um, corrosive to society. So, um, you know, you think about this deterioration, um, and at, at what point is lying become no normative in, in, in the sense that everybody, everybody is doing it. Um, I think that 
at universities, uh, lying on resumes, kind of you know, exaggerating things on resume for students is, is becoming, mm -hmm. I see some of the resumes and I think, oh my goodness, I thought these undergrads worked for me, I didn't realize I worked for them. <laughs> um, um, so so the, the things were, were, where things become really bad and, and it's really hard to stop, it's really hard to stop and you need kind of a collective action to stop it, but that, that would be the, if I could, that, that's the thing I would like to work on. It reminds me of, um, so, so you know, the three of us often focus on sort of behavioral interventions where we're trying to get people in the moment to do something differently. Signing at the top, signing at the bottom is a, is a great example of when you are tempted right then. But what we're, all of us I think struggle much more with is how do we change systems around. So we know of course the system that you're in massively influences your unethical behavior, but of course it's much harder to change those systems. So we're, I think, trying to aggregate up from the kinds of things that we do at a local level where we understand and bringing them up higher. But often it's an institutional change that needs to happen instead of it. So I was just, this is random, but I was just in Singapore. I was thinking when you were talking earlier. So when you land in Singapore, if you, if you have your landing card, two, two interesting things about Singapore for, for unethical behavior. One is you land in Singapore and your landing card looks like landing cards in every other country, except on the back in huge red letters it says, um, possession of drugs punishable by death. <laughs> that's all it says. Nothing else. Murder, who knows? <laughs> Maybe that's fine, but definitely possessing drugs is punishable by death. That's kind of a, uh, if you wanted to stop a behavior, that's pretty good. That's not a subtle thing like what, what we work on. But the other interesting thing about Singapore is, so government corruption is very low, and you could think of all kinds of reasons why it might be low, but it turns out one of the reasons is the founder decided 50 years ago that people in government would get paid a lot of money. Just simply that. So what is your motivation to cheat and be corrupt? In most countries, government workers are underpaid or paid poorly, so you need money to do the things that you'd like to do. You can think about a very simple change where instead you flip the incentive, so I could still be corrupt, I could still be that person if I wanted to, but the pressing need is very, very different. And I think all of us are, are headed, I think, in the direction of how do we aggregate up to, to higher levels. We don't know how to get there unless you do. Um, no, nobody, no, you know, the, I think the sad things about uh, social science um, is that everybody has an intuitive theory of social science and they're very happy to go with their theory. So, so think about biology. Would you ever do a company that deals with biology without hiring people who are biologists? Uh, absolutely not, right? It would sound crazy. But would you be willing to do a government policy about punishment, about anything, without having anybody who actually, without having any experiments, without having any data. Right? Somehow, somehow in social science we're saying, oh, I have a theory of how people behave, um, let me just implement that theory. See, every time you do a policy, you have a theory of how people work and how your intervention is going to change it. And, and this confidence that people have in their own theories and then risking billions of dollars sometimes on, on the fact that this would work. So think about a very small example. Both Bush and Obama gave about $400 billion in tax rebates. They did it in slightly different ways. Uh, Bush gave us a check, Obama made uh, tax deductions a little uh, smaller. It's a lot of money. And shouldn't we, before we um, give $400 billion away, do an experiment? Shouldn't we take like a little state or a little like Rhode Island, right, and say Let, let's try a couple of different things and see, see what works, what works better? Is, are these really the two options, the only, the only two options? So, so the, confidence we, um, the confidence people have in, in their intuitive theories is probably one of the biggest biases and then willing to um, bet a lot mm -hmm. on, their, on, on the fact that it's correct, it's incredible. Um, you know, in the Obama, uh, um, the, the Health Care Act, um, the Affordable Health Care, there's, there's lots of things that change over time, and it's a very complex law, but uh, there was a big element about evidence-based medicine that well, one of the first things that uh, disappeared, <laughs> yeah, right? This idea that we don't know and we'll just experiment and we'll just test and we'll figure out as a, as a basic mechanism is just not there. So I think we uh, should take some questions because I'm sure you have lots of uh, questions for Dan. There are microphones oh. here and here and up there. So if you stand up and get in line behind the microphones, I'll try to go around and make sure uh, people who have questions can uh, ask them. 
I'm going to expect you to solve the institutional problem of corruption <laughs> with your first question, so the pressure is on. <laughs> Don't be shy. He's pretty nice. So if nobody asks, can I, can I, as we wait, can I tell another story? I'm the moderator. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> So uh, I presume you witnessed our recent uh, uh, By the way, can you say who yeah, I'm you are? I'm Richard Zachhauser, and I'm a friend of these people. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask a very easy question. Oh. Uh, I presume that you've watched the presidential debates. And after each one of the presidential debates, if you look at a variety of, I think, nonpartisan websites, they say, here's what Mike said, here's what Dan said, here's what Francesca said. This was true, this was true, this was false, this was false, this was false. This was false. Almost every candidate has said some falsehoods. And they've said it in front of you know, many millions of uh, potential voters. It doesn't seem to hurt them so much. But I'm just wondering, uh, since you've been working on this for years, um, there are two candidates, A and B. You like candidate A's policies better, so on and so forth. But at the debate, B has been, and at multiple debates, scrupulously honest. And A has actually been fairly loose with the truth, saying three complete lies. And I'm just wondering, when you go to the polls, will you go to the person that you used to favor, but who lies, or the person who doesn't lie? And of course, you don't mean me. You mean uh, people in general. No, I, I mean <laughs> you. Oh, you mean me? And then I want you to answer for the populace. Um, so, so, so I think, I think uh, the truth is incredibly important. Um, and I think the truth is kind of a public good. And if we start violating it, lots of bad things happen that we don't see at the moment. However, we've looked at this empirically. And people actually want their politicians to lie. And, 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 I, and I, I use the word want because they prefer politicians that lie because they think that the goal justify the means and that if I care about a particular policy, and by lying, my politician is going to get my policy in, that seems to be a higher uh, order value than the truth. And uh, so this is you know, current state in the US, right? I don't, think, I don't know what it was 50 years ago. I don't know what it will be in 50 years. Uh, but right now, it seems that people care about the outcome of the policy. They're passionate about the policies and less passionate about the truth, and they prefer a, a trade-off. Now, this is especially uh, true for lies um, about policy, uh, but it's also true about personal lies. So you could say, what about a politician that you know fabricates the running speed or you know affairs, all kinds of things like that? They also forgive those uh, to a higher degree from their politicians because it's part of the in-group. So I think the combination of caring very much ideologically about the policy and having a very strong in-group with the party that we care about uh, reduces the weight we give, we give to honesty. And I think politicians know it. So I basically know, let's say I'm a politician, I know that my voters are not going to care that much. In fact, they would see uh, that I'm trying to stand for an outcome and they might actually care more about it. So I think there's a terrible, potentially a terrible cycle there. Thank you. Yes. Hi, um, thank you for coming. My name is Leia Singer. I'm a senior at the college. Um, over the course, course of the four years I've been here, there's been a debate about an honor code, implementing an honor code here at Harvard. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to sort of how effective an honor code is. You did mention that signing something up front um, might help with cheating. But in a competitive environment, how does that um, So you out? said Harvard, I thought. Harvard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, tough crowd, tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so A, we have some results about the, the honor code, and, and it, does, it does work. So we did a study at MIT and at Yale, and we got students to sign the, the honor code. And uh, we saw it had a dramatic reduction on the cheating in, in our experiments. Uh, but this was despite the fact that neither MIT nor Yale have an honor code. Right? So the students signed something. They knew it was meaningless, but, but it still had an effect on them, because it changed your mindset. Uh, similarly, we find that when you swore in the Bible, uh, people stop uh, cheating. Even atheists who swore in the Bible uh, stop cheating. Because, because it's not about heaven and hell. It's about the fact that you're saying, oh, truth is important. Let me 
remind myself the truth is important, let me be a bit more careful. So, so I do think that an honor code is important. I also think it's a social coordination mechanism about what is okay and what is, what is not okay. The version of the honor code that I use in my uh, class is I ask the students in the beginning of either an exam or a paper to write what they think is the right version of the honor code. And, and the reason I do it is uh, not so much that I care exactly what they have to say. <laughs> not nice to not say. All, <laughs> Sorry, uh, honesty, no. <laughs> I deeply care. <laughs> I deeply care about what they want to say, but, but in, addition, in addition, I want them to reflect and think. Because you see, if you got something to sign and it became mechanical, I think it would lose its effectiveness. I think the effectiveness comes from reflection and thinking and resetting uh, where, you want to, where you want to be. Um, one final thing about this is uh, I, I, I spent some time with different branches of the military and different branches of the armed forces have very different honor codes and very different kind of behaviors. Uh, but the guy who was in charge at some point on the honor code at West Point, um, he told me that he would go and violate the honor code on purpose. And not in a big way, but in small ways. And if people told him, he would say, thank you very much. This is exactly what you were supposed to do. And if people did not tell him, he said, hey, you should have told me that I violated the mm -hmm. honor code in this way. And his lay theory was, how could you expect people to tell you about the violation if we don't practice it? So maybe we need to also practice violation and also practice that it's okay to violate something and, and you can have a discussion about this and, and, and so, some, some back and forth. So now we say, what is the, what is the culture around telling people that they're wrong? And, and how could you make this more acceptable? Because if every time you do a violation, you're out, the penalty might be too, too high. So we need to think both about how do we make it socially acceptable and top of mind for people. Yes. Hi, my name is Ignacio. I'm a student at the college. I was wondering if you had ever thought how to implement the results of all your exams or experiments to prevent that behavior in the future, or if you just focused on the why and left it at that. We, we certainly want to, to prevent things. Um, it's a little difficult because, as Mike was saying, you know, we, we need to take over some, some system, and nobody's giving us uh, <laughs> systems to, to take over. So. Um, but for example, I had a, a, I spent a couple of days with, with the, the, the regulators, the financial regulators of, uh, of a, a medium-sized country in Europe. Um, and we went over their, their financial regulation, like, like the, the thing, you know, they took many hours, it's a very long document. And at the end I said, who are you trying to regulate with this? Like, who, who are you trying to regulate? And they didn't understand the question and eventually they said, a psychopath. Why? Because the rules were set for somebody who is vicious and trying to steal money from their clients. Right? So it was rules for bankers, assuming that bankers are just trying to take advantage in any point they can, and they're just doing the cost-benefit analysis, and they're just trying to be evil. And I said to them, you know, many of you were bankers before, you have many bankers' friends. How many sociopaths do you, do you know? Uh, and and they said, not, not that many. Um, <laughs> so, so then I said, okay, so, so what, what are we really trying to prevent? And they agree that you're trying to prevent conflicts of interest. So they changed the regulation and said, let's work toward conflicts of interest, right? Rather than uh, working on people that have a mindset of let's, let's cheat. So that, that has been one, one attempt. Um, uh, the, the BIT group, in the UK are trying to do things now with the signatures that Francesca and I have been doing. There's an experiment in South Africa, similar, so in South America. So we're trying, um, we're not there yet, but, but we're trying. Yeah. I'm, at the, I'm at the MPID program here, and I'm asking about the persistence of lying over the long term. You mentioned that if somebody gets into this, they start with these little things and then it ends up snowballing. But uh, I was reminded of two recent German ministers who have been taken down from cheating on their theses, which were yep. decades and decades before. And can you tell there was, us? There was also something recently with Germany. What was it? Uh, yeah, too, <laughs> too many. I own, I own a Volkswagen. I'm, I'm upset every day when I uh, <laughs> home. Yeah. 
But I'm wondering if, if looking at whether someone cheated on their thesis 30 years ago gives you any sort of indication of whether they'll cheat now, and if you do follow-up experiments with people and look at if they cheated during your thing before, are they more likely to cheat another time? Yeah, so, so I, think, I think I would speculate that the answer is yes, but again, domain-specific. So uh, if I remember correctly, the, the, the German stories, these were both stories about somebody else did the work and they just took credit for it. That, that's a good recollection. Um, you know, so, so if you think about that, I'm not expecting these people to be more dishonest with managing their money. Uh, but, but on that particular domain of taking credit for other people's work, I would say there could be uh, something that is more long-term. Effect. But I wouldn't say because they did this, it means that in every aspect of life there are uh, worse people. I think, in fact, that's one of the ways that we deal with it is we compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I cheated on thing X, but I'm a great father and I'm a wonderful something, and so <laughs> it's a tiny part of who I am. I think we're here now. Hi, um, I'm Stephanie. I'm a research assistant at MIT. Um, I want to follow up on your like, self-deception um, experiment. So. Can you make the case that you're actually making people more confident by, you know, like telling them that they're actually better than they are, and then how do you reconcile the fact that maybe perhaps you can use that to an advantage and nudge for good, and that to make people more confident improves their, you know, test scores, etc. Uh, so you're saying let's let's get people to uh, deceive themselves that they are better than they are, uh, and because of that, for example, they'll be willing to take more risk or uh, do other things. I, I can imagine some edge cases in which convincing you that you're better than you are would be, would be helpful. It's much easier for me to imagine things that will be terrible for you. Um, and so actually, our data look, shows that the performance on the second test is exactly the same. So That's right. So, so, you know, there's a question. I think what you're asking implicitly is under what conditions is this overconfidence going to lead to improved results? And, and I, I think the cases in which it will lead to objective improvement in result is not that high. I think the case in which it will in increase motivation, I can imagine a few cases. Uh, the case in which it increase risk taking is, is probably high. Uh, but overall, I, 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 don't see, I don't see this as being uh, you know, across, the board, across the board useful. And um, not only that, but you know, the problem, the problem with dishonesty, and this was, we, we've done lots of things on, on online dating, as, as Mike was saying, and one of the things we found um, was that uh, people lie on online dating. Um, so in their profiles. We spent billions of dollars yeah, yeah, to billions discover. Of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and people actually spend, lie in online dating in kind of the right way. So, um, you know what, kind of, when you do labor analysis, uh, you take people's salary and you regress it on all kinds of attributes, education and height and race and gender. And this is kind of the result that you uh, use to show that, you know, m women make 85 cents on the, on the dollar. Um, so we imagine that you have this the same for online dating and you take success in online dating. Somebody sends you their phone number or respond to your email and so on. And you regress it on all people's attributes. Um, and now you're asking um, how important is height? Uh, so I'm 5'9". Let's say I would want to be as successful as somebody who's 5'10". Uh, how much more would I have to make a year? Right? Uh, the answer is slightly more than $40,000, by the way. Which means that women really care about height, right? Um, and you can ask, are women really that superficial? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, <laughs> There's some more nuances to this, but, <laughs> um, you know, so, 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 so men uh, lie about heights because women care so much. Uh, women lie about weight, uh, similar reasons. Um, Can you price that? Oh, so, <laughs> so, so we didn't, it was per BMI. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, that's actually what men care about. But um, we also, we also did, uh, we did it with, with money. So uh, what is the return? Uh, for women's BMI in terms of money. Like if you wanted to move from uh, 19 to 21, <coughs> um, how much more would you have to make? What's the answer? 
we couldn't estimate because men just don't care how much money women make in online dating. So, so there's no, uh, no demand. Um, but so, so people learned about the right things, but what we showed is that um, people have a, an online date, they're, they're, they're planning to meet somebody for coffee, and then they meet somebody for coffee, and that person lied to them. And not only did that person lie, but people fill the gaps in over-optimistic ways, and they just get crashed. And they get disappointed, and it doesn't matter how much experience they have in online dating, they get disappointed time after time after time. So what happened is you could say maybe lying has some benefit for, for the individual, maybe some confidence, but you're going to meet other people, and even in online dating where kind of everybody knows that everybody's cheating, it's still disappointing. So I think overall, I don't want to increase deception or self-deception. A colleague of ours says, uh, self-deception is great for you, but it's very difficult for your spouse. <laughs> Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Lerner. I'm also a friend of these guys. Um, I wanted to ask you to talk about some of the really deep obstacles to making system-wide government-level intervention progress. And you mentioned people aren't handing over systems to you, but I'm wondering if there's a more fundamental obstacle, which is that humans are just naturally dispositionalists. We really want to think that cheaters are a certain group of people, and your data actually suggest a radically social interpretation. You suggest everyone is doing this. And um, so is, do you think that, are you encountering that as an obstacle that just our lay intuition completely does not match the data? And can you speak to that? And if you are discovering that, um, how do you surmount that? Yeah, so, so A, it's, it's true, right? So, so if, you, if you take this perspective that we all have the capacity and the fact that we're not all big cheaters is opportunity rather than character, it's a very disturbing perspective. And, and when you look at some of these people and you say, okay, I could have taken that first step and maybe I took a first step at some point and maybe I didn't have the opportunity to take the second step but if I was there, I would have done it. It's a, it's a very disturbing view, view of ourselves. And I think that in the domain of honesty, it's clearly a part of the, of the issue, that people don't want to accept that. Um, but I think in terms of m more, so, so I think in dishonesty, you're absolutely right. We have the penalty system. We, ha we have a very strong belief right now in good and bad, and let's punish people and take them out of, <coughs> of society. Um, but the problem is deeper than just dishonesty. There are lots of things that we could make interventions uh, that would get people to uh, behave well in all kinds of ways, right? We identify all kinds of ways in which um, we could improve um, behavior. Think about uh, eating, dieting, smoking, medication adherence. I mean, there's just a ton of those things that, that if you could only control the system, you would do, you would do much better. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's um, bad intentions in most of those cases. I just think that politicians have a really hard time uh, doing any, any change. Um, so you'll, you'll forgive for me for this. This is not my, my area. But I look at what's happening in China. Uh, the Chinese uh, you know, controller uh, gets 10 years. And because, because he gets 10 years, he gets to do a lot of very dramatic changes. So he comes into office and he says, you know what, we're going to have this thing that you don't waste food. And you serve to yourself on a plate and you have to finish it. And we don't waste. And here's what we're going to do with corruption. And we'll, we'll see what, what will happen. Um, in, in contrast, in the US, we have elections every two years. Um, uh, my, my guess is politicians start thinking about the next election maybe a week after the, the, the results of the previous one. Uh, what capacity do they have to really bring about change? So I think we, we create these gigantic systems that have a force of their own um, and they just keep on uh, propagating. Um, and we don't really stop and say, is this system really terrible and can we restart it again? Um, 
So, so I think it's not evil. I think it's just slowness, laziness, and difficulty um, in, this, in the system. I'm not sure if it's uh, optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, let's, yeah. let's, so we're nearly out of time, so let's <laughs> end on a more uplifting note. Yes. Um, oh, I have a joke. Oh, no, I can't tell a joke. We're, we're recorded. We'll, we'll shut off the cameras in a moment, and Dan will tell his joke. But before that, <laughs> uh, advice for us to go out and be, and be good people. What are, what, are, what are some of the things that, that lead us to just in everyday life, and uh, any ideas for us to not do those things? So, so I think one of the things is, is conflicts of interest. Right? So uh, all of you will have tremendous conflicts of interest in, in your life, and there'll be uh, questions about how you, how you solve it. Um, so uh, I'll tell you one story for me. is I, I was asked to be an expert witness on some, uh, on some lawsuit. Um, this was a lawsuit. Uh, it does, does, doesn't matter. And I said, look, uh, if I get paid uh, by these people, I'll certainly uh, have their perspective in mind when I, uh, and do I really want to be biased? Um, so I decided to do it for free. Um, and I decided I'm only going to do um, expert witness if I'm willing to do it uh, for free because I don't, want to be, I don't want to be biased. Now it's an expensive decision, right? Because I could, I could have got paid uh, well for doing that. Uh, but I also really care about uh, not being biased in my opinion. If you, if you look at expert witnesses, it's terrible. People get paid for multiple sides and they have very different opinions. And um, so, so eliminating conflicts of interest is expensive. Uh, but if we truly understand uh, the strength of it, then um, it would help us. The other thing is I think we need more personal rules. So if you think about human behavior across almost any, any activity, any, any behavior that we have to make a decision every time, we're likely to fail. Uh, uh, think, think to yourself, for example, um, how many of you, and please raise your hand, in the last month have exercised less than you think you should? Okay, a few. Um, how many of you have ever texted uh, while driving? Some of you are students, you know, driving. Um, how many of you have had uh, unplanned, uh, unprotected sex? <laughs> that's, that's very few. That's very few. <laughs> um, so, so you know, if you think if you think about <laughs> if if you think about if you think about these behaviors, um, kind of, you know, uh, overspending, uh, texting, uh, all those things, they rely on us to make a decision every time. And we're just not good at this. We're just not good at this. So, but what we're good at is to have a rule and to try and follow the rule. So uh, you know, successful diets are diets that says no carbs. Um, Alcoholic Anonymous says no drinks. What would happen in, with Alcoholic Anonymous if the rule was half a glass a day? Right? There'll be a market for very big glasses. People would say, I'm not <laughs> drinking today. I'll do two tomorrow. And, when we have to make decisions, we have to recognize that we're really not good in trade-offs. But if we have a rule, and the rule represents something bigger and more meaningful, we're more likely to, to adhere to this. So this will be my two um, suggestions. Thank you. So with that, we oh, are. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, and, joke. and always listen to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> listen to my mother. She's pretty good. So uh, we are at time. So I want to thank the Behavioral Insights Group, the Institute of Politics, for hosting us. Francesca Gino and Dan Ariely, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.